Good morning, friend. I hope you are doing great today. It's about 20 degrees out here on the river, but it's going to warm up and be a pretty nice day around here. Got up into the low 60s yesterday, and it was just a beautiful day. Really windy, though. Uh, we had Damon and Sarah Green, our uh, my PA, our good friends, and uh, five of their six kids over yesterday. It was a beautiful, beautiful family, and just had a great time hanging out with them. Uh, Jackson Green, Damon's son, gave me a fly fishing lesson in the shop yesterday, me and Tata, and that was really fun. We're going to try to learn how to fly fish for some of these bass in Northern Pike out here on the river. Um, the water's often pretty shallow, and it's a little too shallow to bait cast, and so fly fishing ought to be a fun way to catch some of those critters, and then I sure appreciate Jackson coming all the way from Casper to teach us how to do that yesterday. It was really fun. Anyway, I hope you're doing something great today. going to get after work here in a little bit, and I just have a, a quick little mind to change monday episode for you um typically mind change monday is just for the paid subscribers this one's though is going to go out to everybody uh, and there will be a another bonus episode on wednesday of this week just for the paid subscribers but today i need to get a little bit deeper on a topic that i think is for everybody and i didn't want to put it behind the paywall i want everybody to be able to get access to this because it's such an important concept we're going to talk about what we talked about in the newsletter yesterday and listen if you're not getting the newsletter drleewarren.substack.com every sunday i do a, a free self brain surgery Sunday prescription letter to give you some ideas to help change your mind and change your life. And it's it's deep and it's powerful. And we're covering some ground that's in the new book, Hope is the First Dose, which is coming out in July. We're covering some ideas about how you can regenerate or rediscover hope when hard things happen. And there are some tools for that. One of the tools is to learn how to avoid what I call secondary injuries. Okay. We're going to talk about the difference between primary and secondary injuries and three different things we can do to avoid secondary injury and some techniques to avoid making sure that our injuries don't create injuries in somebody else because that's a problem that happens sometimes because hurt people hurt people hurting people hurt people and wounded people wound people and so we're going to talk just a minute about that this morning uh, and then we're going to get after it we have a brand new Tuesdays with Tata episode for tomorrow we're going to have a new paid subscriber only episode on Wednesday that's going to be really powerful uh, for the paid subscribers so if you're not a paid subscriber consider that if you want daily access and you want to go just a little bit deeper than we go on the typical podcast and in the typical letters then Check that out. You can do a seven day free trial if you want to. And it's, there's some value there for folks. And we got to 108 countries in the world last week. 108 countries had at least one download. So wherever you are out there, um, all over Africa, South America, Asia, most of the Middle East countries are listening now. So we're grateful to have you wherever you are. Know that we pray for you. We think about you. We are constantly, Lisa, Tata, and I talking about you, the listener, and we're grateful to be on this journey with you and that this that you must be finding this content helpful. So if you are, we'd love to hear from you. You can send me an email, lee at drleewarren.com. You can click and leave a comment on any post on Substack. You can leave a rating or a review on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to the podcast. And the more you do that, the more you review or rate or comment or click or like, then that helps raise the visibility of the show to other people. So if you think it's valuable, then number one, pray for us to help us uh, spread the message farther. Number two, like, comment, rate, review, and let us hear from you. And number three, consider becoming a paid subscriber if you want to go just a little bit deeper. Now, we're going to go and talk a little bit about the difference between primary and secondary injury here for just a minute today. It's going to be a short little episode, but i got to give you this idea because it's so important. And I want to help you learn how to see that when you're hurt, that you can't really do anything about the fact that the massive thing happened, that something happened. You can't remove the fact that the wound got placed there. What you do next, though, makes all the difference in how you recover, how your family goes forward, what happens in your life after that massive thing. And it's all about avoiding secondary injury because you can't change your life until you change your mind, and you can't always avoid that first wound. But you can make one decision. Lisa's going to tell you. You can decide to start today. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. That place is called self-brain surgery. You can learn it and it will help you become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And the good news is you can start today. 
Thanks, Lisa. Hey, so glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get it done if you'd like the show. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell two or three friends this podcast was helpful to you, imagine how much good we can all do around the world together. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. Okay, I'm excited to share this idea with you because I think it's brown, It's just really important. I was going to say groundbreaking, but it's not groundbreaking. It's stuff that's known about. It's just something you need to hear and think about in a different way, Okay. In, in neuroscience, we talk about the different types of neurotrauma, okay? There's primary injury. And the primary injury, and I see people all the time and have this conversation with them and their families in the ER and in the trauma bay and in the ICU. We talk about the primary injury is what happens when you slip and fall and hit your head on the pavement and you crunch your brain and you damage some brain cells, okay? Or the guy gets in the bar fight and gets hit in the head with a baseball bat. The brain cells that are injured at the moment of impact, you slip and fall, break your neck, the spinal cord gets compressed, and some cells, some neurons in the spinal cord are irrevocably and permanently damaged at the time of impact. That's the primary injury, okay? You can't undo that unless you can go back in time and not have the accident, not have the trauma, not have the assault, not have the whatever, right? The primary injury is a given. That's the the massive thing that happens in life, right? You can't avoid always the phone call where you find out that your son died you can't avoid the doctor telling you that the biopsy result was bad and you can't avoid the cheating spouse or the the crashed economy or any whatever the thing is the the addiction the the childhood abuse that you're dealing with now that those things happened okay the trauma the tragedy that occurred if you think about it in in sort of metaphorical terms in a sense it's a primary injury Okay, then you can't undo it. That injury has happened. And so in my book, I talk about this concept that's really become important in therapy and it's become important in in all of medical care really now is this understanding what we call trauma informed care. Okay, we used to look at a patient's behavior and they would be wild or they'd be non-compliant or they'd be difficult and hard to manage. And we would say, what's wrong with you? And we, we watch our friends and we, we watch our spouses and we interact with our kids and people behave certain ways. They do things that we don't like. And we say, what's wrong with you? Right. A trauma informed care seeks to get to a place where we understand that people behave based on what's happened to them in the past. And their, and their current behavior is a, much more complex thing than them just acting out or being bad people. It's, it's, it has to do with the path that they've walked in their life and the sum total of the experiences that they've got in their, in their backpack of emotional issues that they carry around. All of us do, right? So a trauma-informed approach says not what's wrong with you, but tries to get to the root of what happened to you. If you, if you understand what happened to a person in their past and the path that they've walked, then you can start to kind of unwind and and understand peek under the hood of these behaviors that they're exhibiting and you can help get to the root cause of some of those behaviors and then help not only be a better doctor a better nurse a better pastor a better chaplain a better spouse a better parent whatever to those people because you understand where they've been then you can start dealing with the behaviors in a more in a more enlightened way and help them understand what's happening and why they're behaving that way and then you can get a, a whole person approach rather than just a behavioral approach right trauma-informed care is important and it, it comes down to the start of the the first question not what's wrong with you but what happened to you? But shortly after I wrote my book, as after I had submitted it, sold it, editing it, it's coming out, I discovered a, a psychologist and writer from Canada named Gabor Mate. And he's written a lot about trauma. And he's got a really cool book um, called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts that's about addiction. And he's got another book called The Myth of Normal that's about all this pressure we put on ourselves to be normal when nobody's normal. We're all weirdos, right? <laughs> but no, it's, it's just a beautiful book. And he's done a bunch of YouTube videos about about trauma and trauma care and all that. And he said something that's, it, it's, it sounds at first like a very subtle distinction. 
that most of us, especially like uh, those of us who have read Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, and things like that, most of us are getting the idea now about trauma-informed care and how important it is. But Gabor Mate made a really subtle distinction that I think is important, and I want to just give it to you right now. He said he doesn't like to think of trauma as what happened to you. That you're, if you've got PTSD or they're calling it PTSS, post traumatic stress syndrome now, because it's not a disorder, it's a syndrome or complex syndrome of behaviors and thoughts and emotional issues and hormonal changes and all these things that recur in response to complex trauma. And so PTSS, if you want to call it that, if you, if you think about it as coming out of what happened to you, then you can't change it. And in Gabor Mate's language, the way he talks to his patients, he says that if, if it's what happened to you that's making you behave this way, then you're hosed because you can't undo what happened. The massive thing happened, and you can't make it not have happened, right? So if, if how you're living now and how you're feeling and how you're behaving is because of what happened to you, then you're stuck. So the subtle distinction is this. He says it's not what happened to you. It's how your body and your brain responded to what happened to you that's producing what you're dealing with now. Not the event, but the response to the event. And that's important, and it sounds subtle, but it's not really so subtle the more you think about it. Because if what you're feeling is a bunch of chemical events in your brain and a bunch of behavioral patterns that you started even unaware of yourself, you started because you were reacting to something that happened, you can examine that stuff and explain it better and you can start changing it. You can change your life if you can change your mind. And you can always change your mind. Okay? So the subtle distinction, but trauma's not what happened to you. It's how you responded to what happened to you. Because you can't go back and bring my son back to me and put him back in my house. I wish you could. You can't undo that affair that happened. You can't unwind that 20 years of addiction that happened after your uncle did that thing to you that you were in a trusted place and they shouldn't have done when you were eight, right? You can't undo that, but you can com- understand the complex responses you had to that. And once you understand that, you can begin to change, right? And on a more normal, typical level, you can learn to look critically at the patterns of behavior in your marriage that have been so destructive between you and your spouse and years of mistreating each other with passive aggressivism and all those things. And you can start to unwind that and you can change it and you can restore your relationship if you want to, but you have to use self brain surgery to get to it. All that said, yesterday in my newsletter, I wrote about primary and secondary injury. So again, the primary injury is the thing that happened that you can't undo, right? And when I take care of a brain injury patient, for example, the outcome is always determined primarily by the severity of the primary injury. If you had too many neurons die, I can't fix that and I can't make you better, right? But oftentimes, there's a bunch of neurons that are dead, and there's a bunch of neurons that are injured but have a chance to recover or a chance to go on to die. And our battle then is against all the physiological and chemical forces, brain swelling and and cellular damage and, and electrochemical disturbances and seizure activity and nutritional status and all these things that, that are going to help nurture those, those suffering neurons that have a chance to recover and help more of them recover than not recover. And the secondary injury is the loss of additional brain cells that didn't die at the time of impact that go on to really predict how the patient's ultimately going to do. So I can influence secondary injury. I can limit it by making sure that I treat brain swelling aggressively, by making sure that we got the right sodium and potassium and electrolyte levels, by making sure the patient has enough oxygen and hemoglobin and they're not anemic and there's not an infection or something else that we can deal with. So preventing secondary injury is crucial to the patient's ultimate recovery. Does that make sense? Okay, so sorry, I have a little cold or something going on this morning, so I apologize about my voice. Nevertheless, we want to talk for just a second here on Mind to Change Monday about primary injuries and secondary injuries as it relates to things that we can deal with using self-brain surgery. And the point that I want to make that's deeper than the newsletter, and go read the newsletter. I'll put a link in the show notes. So I'm going to get after it. And we're going to wrap this up. The, the, the bottom line is when you are hurt, when the massive thing has happened and you are hurt, you can make it worse or you can make it better 
by changing how you think about it and changing how you behave. But the number one thing is to be critically aware that when you're hurt, there is a chance, a real chance, for you to make it worse by things that are not the fault of whatever caused the massive thing. That's hard to say because we want to blame everything in our life on somebody else or something else. But the bottom line is you can't stop the knife from having sliced you, but you can stop the fact that you did or didn't put a tourniquet on it to stop the bleed. You can change the fact that you did or didn't manage the wound properly. You can change the fact. You are responsible, in fact, for the fact that once you understand the wound that you decided to go and have it sutured or not, right? You you are in control once you understand it, now you need help sometimes, but you're in control of whether or not you try to get on a path towards recovery or you try to, or you stay on a path towards worse and worse, further and further secondary injury. Because secondary injuries damage or kill cells or hearts or families or marriages that had a chance otherwise to recover. But we need to use a better treatment plan to keep those secondary injuries from piling up. And one category that I didn't talk about yesterday that I want to talk about today just for a second is this idea that when you have a primary injury, when a massive thing has happened to you, when you've gone through something hard, it is really easy for you to hurt other people around you in your world because you're hurting. And there's, a, there's an old motto, hurting people hurt people. This is why if you really look at many alcoholics and pedophiles and serial killers and people that have really gone down a bad path in their life or become sociopaths, many of them, huge, staggering, beyond statistical chance, percentage of them had some serious disturbance and dysfunction in their primary family of origin. They had a father wound. They had a bad, a mom who was crazy or did something bad to them, an uncle who was abusive to them. Something happened. They were in foster care and somebody mistreated them. The people that grow up and have really severe problems often had a really bad situation when they were young, right? And we know that. Everybody knows that. But what we don't talk about is often it's when you have something bad in your past that's happened to you, some trauma, some tragedy, some massive thing, some turmoil that's happened to you, is that you can pass that pain along to the people around you. You can become just grumpy all the time, and that can make your kids become grumpy people who create synapses that predict and reproduce grumpy behavior or a baseline negative attitude. You can use a substance to cover up your pain, and that will dramatically increase the chance that one of your children will have a substance issue when they grow up because they model your behavior, right? You can be snippy and passive aggressive and grumpy with your spouse and create a chill in your marriage that produces a model for your children that married people are supposed to be sort of almost frenemies. And you can have tension and turmoil in your house and people are never going to be comfortable in their own skin because they don't know how you're going to behave on a given day. Is dad going to be in a good mood today or is dad going to be in a bad mood today? Is dad going to be overly critical of me today or is he going to give me false praise today? I don't know where I stand. I'm confused because I don't know how my grandfather is going to be today, right? What does that do? That sort of secondary injury that you extend to other people creates generational issues in your family. Remember we talked a while back on Tuesdays with Tata about these two different scriptures. Um, one's in Ezekiel, um, where's it at? Jeremiah thirty one twenty nine and Ezekiel 18, 2, with this old Proverbs, the father has eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. The, the, the kid, that the people in Israel had this excuse that they carried around for generations that we're under this situation and we behave the way we do because our dads weren't faithful or our, our father sinned and God's punishing us. And they had this woe is me attitude about our, our parents did these things and we're stuck with this behavior, Right. That's kind of the model of primary and secondary injury, but but God flipped it on its head and said, hey, stop it. Yes, your parents sinned. Yes, your parents did that. Yes, that's why you went into exile. But no, you're now responsible for your own behavior, right? So there's a path out of those secondary curses, those secondary injuries. There's a There's a time to stop making excuses for somebody else's impact on your life and change your own mind. But the bottom line is if you get smart about it, 
Sorry, my voice is driving me crazy today. If you get real smart about it and you get real introspective about it, you can say, hey, I yes, I have this issue. And yes, I have this wound. And yes, I have this problem. And yes, I went through this tragedy. But I don't want to make that create a problem for somebody I love. I want to get help. I want to change. I want to change my mind. I want to get serious about Mind Change March, and I want to stop it with me. I don't want this this issue to become a generational issue in my family, right? Lisa and I were acutely aware of that after we lost Mitch. We were like, we know that it would be really easy for us to get bitter and get angry, and especially because we don't get to know what happened to Mitch. The, the police never really figured out what occurred in that house. So we, we just have to live with the fact that our son and his best friend died, and we don't really know the truth about what happened. And that could have driven me crazy. I could have gone down this rabbit hole. In fact, I had a friend who's a police officer that suggested get an investigator, go you know, subpoena the records, get get in the middle of it and go fight and try to figure this out and we realized at some point that even if we figured it out it wouldn't bring mitch back but it would make us bitter and it would make us angry and it would make us you know take the eye off the ball of the fact that we had four other kids to raise and a new grandchild to raise and it would make us go down this hole of something that we couldn't fix at the end of it even if we understood all the moving parts of it and so we were aware of the fact that we were injured But we could create some injuries around us and the people that we were responsible for and who looked to us for healing and help in those difficult times. And we just said we made a decision. We were not going to create secondary injuries. Sometimes when we take care of trauma patients, friend, they've got things that can hurt us on the caregiver side. They've got diseases in their blood, HIV or hepatitis C, and we have to be careful because we can get hurt by taking care of these hurt people. They've got fractured, open bones sticking out that are sharp. And you can, in fact, I've cut myself on the protruding bone of a human trauma victim before. So that's an, a secondary injury from their trauma that hurt me in my life, right? Broke my glove and cut my hand on a protruding humerus one time. It's it's just happens. Sometimes people have knives or razor blades in their pockets, and when we're trying to get their clothes off of them, caregivers get stuck with a needle or a blade because you can get hurt by trying to help somebody else in their hour of need. Sometimes drunk trauma patients fight us and punch people and, and injure people. I got knocked out when I was a, a pre-med student. I was working in the ER in Oklahoma City, and this drunk guy was lacerated, and the orderly was trying to get him situated so they could suture his wound. And the guy punched me right in the solar plexus, and I lost my breath and fell backwards and hit my head and knocked myself out. In fact, I was for a while doubtful that I was going to have what it took to go to medical school because I was embarrassed by having been knocked out in the ER. Everybody made a lot of fun of me about that. But the bottom line is hurting people hurt other people. And so for you and for me, I want you to be aware that when you're hurting, it's easy to offload and and try to find some dopamine and serotonin by unloading that fury and rage that you're feeling in your limbic system by blowing up on somebody else. It's it's, it's comforting for a minute to to offload, to snip, to be passive aggressive, to be grumpy, to be uh, irritable, to be frankly abusive, and somehow that makes you feel better. But when you do that, you're creating a wound that has a real chance of getting passed on to another generation of your family, right? So I just wanted to raise that awareness. The father's teeth, or your teeth don't have to be set on edge forever because your father's had sour grapes. You can break that chain. Being aware of this trauma-informed model of how we live our lives. It's critically important, friend, because you have primary injury that you can't fix. You have secondary injury that you can prevent or improve, and that will make all the difference in how you ultimately recover. Remember, hope is always there. If you feel frustrated and lost by the massive thing that you've been through and you don't think it can ever feel different because of the abuse that you suffered or the loss that you suffered or the situation that you're currently in or the addiction that seems impossible to break, there are ways to get help, and you can get help. Sometimes you need professional help. Don't ever hear me when I tell you all these things about how you can change your own mind. Don't ever substitute that for a doctor or a therapist. If you're if, if, if trying to deal with it on your own isn't enough, you need professional help. Go get it, okay? Because if you know you need it and you don't get it, that's a form of self-malpractice. 
And when we talk about self-brain surgery, it's not a gimmick and it's not a positive thinking, motivational speaker type thing. We know from neuroscience, from functional imaging studies, we know that you can change the chemical and hormonal and neurotransmitter balance in your brain by changing how you think. And we know that thinking better thoughts produces better synapses that get into the DNA of your brain. And even the study of epigenetics, we haven't gotten there yet, but when we talk about epigenetics, we know for sure now that that thinking changes and environmental things that happen around you can change the DNA of pregnant women and, and you can actually inherit some genes that predispose you to stress or anxiety or depression if your mother was in a stressful or anxious or depressed situation when she was pregnant. So so it's real. It's it's for real. The things you think about get into your DNA and they can affect your family. And so it's time to stop that. It's time to change our minds and change our lives, friend. And it's time to avoid secondary injury by starting today. Hey, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And if you like the show, you'll love my weekly letter. Check out my writing at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. Get the free newsletter every week for my best prescriptions for becoming healthier, feeling better, and being happier through the power of faith and neuroscience smashing together via self-brain surgery, drleewarren.substack.com. And if you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at wleewarrenmd.com slash prayer. The theme music for the show is Make Us One by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by the great folks over at tommywalkerministries.org. Check it out and consider supporting them, tommywalkerministries.org. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you, friend. Have a great day.